I think I will forgive you today. Whenever I preach here, he gives me like, you know, 20 verses, and you get 45 minutes to preach it. You know, um, so I, I'm deciding to forgive you. I know you're better looking than me, and at least that's what my wife told me. But I will forgive you for this, okay? Okay. So, good morning. Um, there's six members here from our church in, in South Bend, Indiana, and I made the mistake of telling John Westmus that we, we this place is in the Waterford Estates Lodge. There's a hotel on the right on the road, but in the back is this Waterford Estates Lodge, and the room that we preach in is a room they built on it to be a comedy club. So. Unfortunately, I mentioned that to Rick Jordan, and now everybody, everybody knows that I preach in a comedy club. So, let's go to First Corinthians, Second Corinthians, chapter five. Let me read you my passage, verses nine through seventeen. Wherefore we labor that, whether present or absent, we may be, may be accepted of Him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that every one may receive the things done in his body, according to that he hath done whether it be good or bad. Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men, but we are made manifest unto God, and I trust also are made manifest in your consciences. For we commend not ourselves again unto you, but give you occasion to glory on our behalf, that ye may have somewhat to answer them which glory in appearance and not in heart. For whether we be beside ourselves, it is to God, and whether we be sober, it is for your cause. For the love of Christ constraineth us, because we thus judge, that if one died for all, then we're all dead, and that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them, and rose again. Wherefore henceforth know we no man after the flesh, yea, though we have known Christ after the flesh, yet now henceforth know we him no more. Wherefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you once again for this time of fellowship in your word. And I just pray that your word today spring anew in all of us. And every word spoken just redound to your glory. Amen. I'm going to take this passage and divide it up into three sections. There's going to be verses 9 and 10. Then it's going to be after that, um, verses 14 to 17. Then I'm going to take the middle section. And if you go to 1 Corinthians chapter 3, you'll see why I'm going to be doing this. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Paul says, verse 10, According to the grace of God, which is given unto me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation. And another buildeth thereon. But let every man take heed how he buildeth thereupon. For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now if any man build upon this foundation gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, and stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide, which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. Notice that word is singular, not plural. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved at souls by fire. Now I want you to go to Colossians chapter 1. And here's how I'm going to break down this passage. In Colossians chapter 1, let me read you verses 9 and 10. Colossians chapter 1, verse 9. For this cause we also, since the day we heard of, we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to desire that ye might be filled with the knowledge of his will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding, that ye might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. So we see three words in here. There's knowledge, wisdom, and understanding. That they might all be worthy of the Lord. Knowledge, wisdom, and understanding. Now in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, there's three things we're going to be graded on or when we go to the judgment seat of Christ. Even if all our works are burnt off, we're still going to get a reward in heaven. 
Gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, and stubble. How? Conduct as a son is the first, first one. Conduct as a son requires knowledge. We're going to be graded on conduct as a son, um, suffering as a servant, and something, forget it right now. Suffering as a soldier and service as a servant. Sorry about that. So those three sections. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1. To be a son it requires knowledge. I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called. Now the word vocation, do you know what that word means? It's a little different from occupation. It's just another word to prove that we have free will. We get to choose. Paul says, I beseech you. He says, it doesn't say, I command you. I implore you. Understand this, what's going on. 1 Corinthians uh, 7.10. Let me just read some verses here. I'm going to be reading more verses than we're going to. 2 Corinthians 7.10 says, For godly sorrow worketh repentance. That means change of mind. To salvation not to be repented of. But the sorrow of the world worketh death. What is the sorrow of the world? It's the ungodly multitude, the ones who are against the cause of Jesus Christ. If you're sorrowful with a godly sorrow, you can only do that after you're saved. Because if we can't lose our salvation, isn't that a blessing? And is that different from the ages to come? Do you see down here, up here? Romans 11, 29, for the gifts and calling. Now, every time I use the word calling, it's going to be that same word, vocation. Of God are without repentance. It's unregretted. God gave us a gift, and he calls it a free gift. He does not, give him, he does not regret saving people, giving them that gift. 2 Timothy 1, 9, who says, who has saved us and called us within the holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. So, we got gifts and calling of God. That's vocation. Then we have the holy calling. If you go to Ephesians chapter 1, verse 18, you'll see the next calling. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 18. Which says, The eyes of your understanding, being enlightened, that ye may know what is the hope of his calling and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. So we got gifts and calling, holy calling, the hope of his calling. And that word hope there is the Greek word elpis, which means a confident expectation of a future certainty. Philippians chapter 3, verse 14. You'll see the next one. Philippians 3, verse 14. Paul says, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Now look at who said that. Paul's the apostle for the Gentiles. He doesn't magnify himself. He magnifies his office. How many Christians know that? And if you get the chance to tell them that, are they just thrilled and they jump up and down with joy? Or do you get attacked? This is why we need to be a soldier. We need to learn how to defend ourselves. And the last one I'm going to use is Hebrews chapter 3, verse 1, which says, Wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle, apostle and high priest of our profession, Christ Jesus. So we've got the gifts and calling of God. We've got the holy calling, and this is the word vocation. We have the hope of his calling. We have a high calling. Then we have the heavenly calling. Do you get the sense that God wants us to do something after we're saved? Is that what you get? When we go to go to go to heaven, we know that absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. When we go to heaven, my, my brother just passed away in, in January, and uh, he's 67. He suffered terribly with emphysema, which is something that afflicts my family very much. When we go to heaven, we're not going to be floating on a cloud, playing a harp drinking Johnny Walker Black. He wants to... Whatever we get down here, whatever we put inside our body, in our body, 
we're going to be able to do that. We're going to be given whatever position God puts us in based on our qualification we had down here, on what we built into our heart and soul. Ephesians 2.10 says, For we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Not understanding Pauline truth is receiving the grace of God in vain, which is the title of this conference. What is receiving the grace of God in vain? If you don't rightly divide the word of truth, if you don't understand Pauline truth, if you think you can lose your salvation, what are you going to do to people? It's, it's vanity. You're going to give them, you can be saved, but your works after that is going to be nothing. Because eventually you're going to mix something up or you're going to, well, this is the difference between our standing in Christ and our state in the world. Our state is the knowledge that we accrue. One is our position. Colossians 2.10 says you are complete in Christ. And the other is our standing, our practice, I'm sorry, which says that you put off concerning the former man, this is Ephesians 4.22, the conversation of the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lusts. You put off the former man, former conversation of the old man. What does the word conversation mean? Well, can mean what you talk, but actually this is talking about the way we walk, our morals, our attitude, what comes from within us, what motivates us to, to follow what Christ said. Go to John chapter 20, and I say this, this next verse here, because as I was talking to Bill earlier, he also was raised Catholic. John chapter 20. Look at verse 23. And while you're going there, I want you to get Mark chapter 2. Mark chapter 2. Did God ever get, give humans the, the power to forgive sin? Look at the verse here, John 20, 23. Whosoever sins you remit, they are remitted unto them. Whosoever sins you retain, they are retained. So the question again, did God ever give humans the power to forgive sin? Go to Matthew, Mark chapter 2. Let me read your verses. Where am I at? 5 to 12. Mark chapter 2, verse 5. But when, Je when Jesus saw their faith, he said unto the sick of the palsy, Son, thy sins be forgiven thee. But there were certain of the scribes sitting there, and reasoning in their hearts. Why doth this man thus speak blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God only? And immediately after, when Jesus perceived in his spirit that they so reasoned within themselves, he said unto them, Why reason ye these things in your hearts? Whether it is easier to say to the sick of the palsy, Thy sins be forgiven thee, or to say, Arise, and take up thy bed, and walk, but that ye may know that the Son of Man hath power on earth to forgive sins. He saith to the sick of the palsy, I stand to thee, arise, take thy bed, and go thy way into thine house. And immediately he arose, took up the bed, and went forth before them all, insomuch that they were all amazed and glorified God, saying, We never saw it on this way. But they're saying, they, We never saw it like this, after this manner. Yeah. Okay. I'll try to. I thought I was speaking loud already. How's this? Okay. I don't want to shout. All right. I'm, I'll try. Yeah. So, I'm, I'm going to ask you again. Did God ever give humans the power to forgive sin? What does is, what is Mark 2.7 say? You can't. Who can forgive sins but God only? The rabbis, there were Christ, never once claimed the power to forgive in the sense of gospel forgiveness. Although the same word can be used to mean forgiveness. Nothing could be more offensive to the rabbinical culture at that time than to go around and offering free forgiveness without any external obedience 
or deference to the binding rules laid up and piled up by the rabbis. Did you get that? They didn't see them doing any works for the sins they committed. This is why the rabbis were extremely angry with Christ when they accused him of blasphemy for declaring someone forgiven and angrily said, Who can forgive sins but God only? Which he countered by claiming to be God in John chapter 8. 1 Timothy 2.5 says, There is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. 1 Corinthians chapter 9. 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Paul says, 1 Corinthians 9 verse 18, What is my reward then? Verily, that when I preach the gospel... I may make the gospel of Christ without charge, that I abuse not my power in the gospel. Do you remember the passage in Galatians chapter 2 when James, Cephas, and John acknowledged who seemed to be pillars, acknowledged that Paul was the man for the hour, they extended the right hands of fellowship? They took their apostolic authority, probably the last time, and sanctioned and recognized Paul that he was the man for this time with a different gospel and a different message. They took the path. Paul's reward, this privilege is ours also. Let me read you some verses in, in the book of Job. This is how God sees us when he looks down on men. Job 34, 21 and 22, it says, For his eyes are upon the ways of man, and he seeth all his goings. There is no darkness nor shadow of death where the workers of, an, where the workers of iniquity may hide themselves. Remember what we talk about in Christianity? What, what is character? Character is, you know, what you do in the dark. God's looking upon us all the time. The angels, Ephesians 3.10, are looking on us too. The ones that aren't the bad angels, they look down and they see people when they come into this truth, body truth, Pauline truth. Guess what happens to us? The people open up their arms and say, I'm going, to make, I'm going to adopt you as my son or daughter? No. We don't like that, is what they say. Proverbs 21, verse 2 says, Every way of a man is right in his own eyes, but the Lord pondereth the hearts. Proverbs 11, 7, When a wicked man dieth, his expectation shall perish, and the hope of unjust men perisheth. Now let me give you one of Paul's verses. Titus chapter 1, verse 2. In hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began. Do you recall another verse that's talking about some information that was kept secret since before the foundation of the world? Pauline truth. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 3.12, Seeing then that we have such hope, we use great plainness of speech. This hope, this understanding, is what makes us not receive the grace of God in vain. And that's about the conduct of the Son. The next topic is servant, service as a servant. And wisdom is the proper use of knowledge. Second Corinthians chapter 5, let me read this again, verses 14 to 17. For the love of Christ constraineth us, because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead. And that he died for all, by the way, What's the definition of all? Does all mean all? Then why do people say some? They have not received, or they received the grace of God in vain, haven't they? That he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. Wherefore henceforth know we no man after the flesh, Yea, though we have known Christ after the flesh, yet now henceforth know we him no more. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. 
Now, most of you know that Debbie and I have been on the phones for the last 20 years. I can't tell you how many people that we've talked to, it doesn't matter what age, when they open their hearts up to this truth, it becomes like a new book. It is a new book to them. It's extremely excited. You can never be too old to love. You can never be too old to learn doctrine, can you? What does it mean by we have known Christ we don't, we, after the flesh? We no longer preach what Jesus Christ in the flesh preached to the nation of Israel. We preach the exalted Jesus Christ who now sits at the right hand of the Father as the head of the church, the body of Christ, the one new man. Romans 6, 17 and 18 says, But God be thanked that ye were the servants of sin, but you have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you. I'm delivering this form of doctrine right now. The other preachers will do the same thing. Being then made free from sin, you became the servants of righteousness. If you think that you have to keep the law, are you free or are you in bondage? I used to have somebody that called me every two years. And he, I don't know why he did this, but he said, you know, I used to believe in that, but I went back to the law. I grew up. What does God say about people who did that? Are you a grown-up or are you a child? Second Timothy 24 to 25 says, And the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, patient, and make this instructing those that oppose themselves if God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth, to perceive with certainty, to understand clearly. We spend a lot of time talking to people. Sometimes people, they call, they want to argue. Um, sometimes people want to tell us how happy they are. Um, we get more of the first kind of calls. They, they kind of trick you. They, uh, they call with a question, but they, what they actually have is an agenda. And you can smell these people out if you've been doing it for a while, real quick. You know, so, so you didn't call with a question. You called, so you lied. All right? This is the bottom line. Now, go to Galatians chapter 1. Let me read you verses 6 through 9. It takes scriptural and spiritual wisdom to explain the following passage. Galatians chapter 1. Paul says to the Galatians, I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another. But there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we are an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. As we said before, so say I now again. If any man preach any other gospel unto you than that ye have received, let him be accursed. The problem here is Jesus Christ is the foundation for both programs. The beginning of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, Mark chapter 1, verse 1. He's foundational. So to be scriptural but not dispensational turns out to be the worst doctrine, the most dangerous doctrine you can put out. And people will come to this patches and scrape, you know, scratch their head. Why would Paul put the word angel in this passage? Let me give you the reason why, and it's found in Revelation 14, 6. I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth, and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people. What are they going to be preaching in the ages to come time period? Are they going to be preaching the gospel of grace? No. They're going to be preaching the everlasting gospel, the Abrahamic covenant, the gospel of the kingdom. So when you don't understand that, you're receiving the grace of God in vain. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 15, you see the word henceforth is used three times in this passage. The first one is not henceforth. It's, it's an adverb. It's used to just modify the sense of a verb and some other things. It means no longer, no more, not hereafter from this time forward. Romans 14, 13 says, Let us not therefore judge one another anymore. That's the word, is anymore. But judge this rather, rather, that no man put a stumbling block or an occasion to fall in his brother's way. 1 Corinthians 6, 12, All things are lawful unto me, but all things are not expedient, profitable. 
All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. We get to make up our own minds how we treat people. Hopefully it's from the Word of God. Because that's the only thing that's going to give them the truth. The next time this, uh, henceforth is used, it's used as a preposition. Now let me describe, describe what a preposition is. It's a word put before another to express some relation or quality, action or motion, to or from the thing specified. To or from the thing specified. Contextually defined. Of any kind of a separation of one thing from another. By which the union or fellowship of the two is destroyed. Now, in other words, this means if you don't rightly divide the word of truth, and you don't understand Pauline truth, you're going to deprive somebody. You're going to keep back some information. You're going to rot. You're going to commit fraud, according to God's word. Do you know what fraud is? Fraud is the crime of using dishonest methods to take something valuable from another person. Now, let's say somebody gets saved. And they don't go to a right division church. They go to a Baptist church. They might believe that you can lose your salvation. Did they just take away something valuable? They didn't take away their salvation. They took away the work that God was ha would have us to do for the rest of their lives. Because he's unsure, he or she is unsure about salvation. That's why we say it's salvation, not probation. Once saved, always saved. We can't lose it. Why? It's not because of us. It's because him. He made the process, promise. He said he was going to do it. If we were left up to any of us, it would not be the same way. Go to 2 Corinthians chapter 7 and look at verse 1. 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 1. Which says, Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from, that's the same word, you're going to separate, all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. God would like our state to match up with our standing. We're complete in Christ. Now, none of us is ever going to attain that, but it shouldn't be from lack of trying. James chapter 5, verse 4 says, Behold the hire of the laborers, who have reaped down your field, fields, which is of you kept back by fraud. A laborer is worthy of his reward. The fellow doing this, he kept back their money. He was fraudulent. He deceived them. If any Christian does not teach the word of God rightly divided, according to the Lord, they are being fraudulent. First Timothy 6, 5 says, here's to stay away from perverse disputings of men of corrupt minds and destitute of the truth, supposing that gain is godliness from such withdraw thyself. Now this doesn't mean that we stop witnessing in the world, but if you've tried witnessing to people, if you've tried to give somebody the gospel, if you, if you told somebody that you're securing your salvation, and you know, you give them enough time and they still won't believe it, you know, God says to mark them and to leave them. It's like, so many people I've talked about, you know, once they understand right division and it becomes a new book to them, they all say the same thing. It's a new book. But I'm going to this other church and, you know, I like the people there. And what should I do? And well, that's up to you. But there's three ways to come out of an ungodly church. You come out, you sell out, or you get kicked out. So, and I tell people, do not cause any trouble. Just leave quietly. That's the way to do it. So, once they understand this truth, like all of us, you start being able to pick things apart. I watched the TV evangelists for a while. You know, 700 Club and, you know, Jack Van Impey and all that. And as I started to get instructed, as I grew in knowledge, I, I realized that guy just said something wrong. He doesn't rightly divide the words. He's not giving people the comfort and the confidence that they need to have. He's not doing that. And pretty soon I just got fed up with everybody, so I stopped watching them. And that was a good thing. Romans 
6, verses 17 and 18 again. Let me read it to you. But God be, be thanked that you were the servants of sin, but you have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you, being then made free from sin. It doesn't say possibly being made free from sin. Being made free from sin, you became the servants of righteousness. 2 Corinthians 4, 7 says, But we have this treasure in earthen vessels, that the excellency of the power may be of God, not of us. Anything you do that's right, don't ever take the credit for it. God gets the credit. It's His Word that's in you, that's, that work at the facts in those that believe. Go to Galatians chapter 2. Let me show, back up this one verse I just read. Galatians chapter 2. Verses 20 and 21. Paul says, Am I speaking loud enough, Mariana? You think? Okay. Am I, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. In the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not frustrate the grace of God, for if righteousness come by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. The whole book of Galatians is about saved people that are going back under the law. I'll get to that in just a minute. Ephesians chapter 3, verses 16 and 17 says, That he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might by his Spirit in the inner man. God works on the inner man today exclusively. That Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that ye, that ye being rooted and grounded in love. I forgot the end of that. What is the definition of the... I'm sorry. Be strengthened with might by His Spirit in the inner man. That Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that ye being rooted and grounded in love. What is the definition of the inner man? And by the way, this is the only time this Greek word is used. Paul has so many words and phrases that are only used by him. I've had thoughts of trying to compile things, but you know things get in the way. There's a lot of words that are exclusive to Paul that puts it waist high right across the plate. This is our soul and our conscience is the inner man. First Thessalonians chapter two, verse thirteen. First Thessalonians chapter two, verse thirteen. Paul says, For this cause also thank we God without ceasing. Because when ye received the word of God, which ye heard of us, ye received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. Now I know this is thrilling for everybody here to hear, but to hear this, but I think we all know how it affects other people that we talk to. Other Christians. You're not going to be very popular by doing this, which is why we need to be a soldier. Suffering as a soldier requires understanding. You have to understand your enemy and your weapon. How many people know they have a weapon? What's it called? The sword of the spirit. It's a double edged sword. Life unto life, death unto death. 2 Corinthians 5, 11-13. Paul says, Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. We don't command anybody. Don't tell people things. That, don't tell anybody what to do. Let them make their own decisions. You know, Especially when they're new in the faith. But we were, are made manifest unto God, and I trust also are made manifest in your consciences. Your consciences. The Word of God, when it's, when it's spoken, when you speak a word, it goes out somewhere and it lands in people's brains. It can never be gotten back. For we commend not ourselves again unto you, but give you occasion to glory on our behalf, that ye may have somewhat to answer them which glory in appearance and not in heart. For whether we be beside ourselves, it is to God, or whether we be sober, it is for your cause. Verses 13, 11 through 13 here in 2 Corinthians 5 fits 1 Corinthians 9.22 when Paul says, I made all things to all men that I might by all means save some. We, to, we are to adapt 
our attitude towards people individually or group-wise, and tailor our response or the talking to everybody. And this, this, you can't do this overnight. You can only learn this through um, hard knocks. Now, there are three reasons to mention God's terror. First one is to warn unbelievers. Go to First Thess Second Thessalonians, chapter one. Second Thessalonians, chapter one. Let me start at verse three. We are bound to thank God always for you, brethren, as it is meet, because that your faith groweth exceedingly, and the charity of every one of you all toward each other aboundeth, so that we ourselves glory in you in the churches of God for your patience and faith in all your persecutions and tribulations that ye endure. I'm fond of saying that what we preach, we preach reality, don't we? Is your outward man perishing? Do you suffer persecutions? Are you depressed at some times? All right. Which is a manifest token of the righteous judgment of God, that ye may be kind of worthy of the kingdom of God, for which ye also suffer. Now that's the heavenly kingdom. Seeing it is a righteous thing with God to recompense tribulation to them that trouble you. Leave the vengeance to God. And to you who are troubled, rest with us when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. They don't know him or they don't obey him. They don't rightly divide the word of truth. They're scriptural, not dispensational. Who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power when he shall come to be glorified in his saints and to be admired in all them that believe because our testimony among you was believed in that day. Wherefore also we pray always for you that our God will count you worthy of his calling and fulfill all the good pleasure of his goodness and the work of faith with power that the name of our Lord Jesus Christ may be glorified in you and ye in him according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. The second reason, if you go to 2 Corinthians chapter 1, to talk about the terror of the Lord, 2 Corinthians chapter 1, is because it comforts the afflicted and the persecuted. Now, it doesn't make me happy that we're getting older. You people are afflicted and persecuted. And, I mean, I'm glad that's happening because I'm not the only one. Okay, You comfort one another like this. Okay, You can see you're, you're getting older this year. You're faltering here. You know, it's, it's, we know that. It's, it's an internal thing. But first, 2 Corinthians 3, uh, chapter 1, verse 3. Blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort who covereth us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. Is this hard to understand? For as the sufferings of Christ abound in us, so, so our consolation also aboundeth by Christ. If you're desirous of comforting somebody, are you going to go up and point a finger in their face? You got to do this. You got to do that. Don't ever tell people what to do. Don't do that. They'll get angry. If when people told you that, it you know made you angry, didn't it? If you go to a different church, if you come from a different church, if you go to a church that they they taught you, you can lose your salvation. Vengeance is mine, say the Lord. Just get up and leave quietly. You either come out, you sell out, or you get kicked out. First Peter 3.14 says, But if ye suffer for righteousness' sake, happy are ye, and be not afraid of their terror, neither be troubled. We've got a lot of terror going on in the world today, don't we? If you suffer for something that you didn't do, and you don't retaliate, that's what this verse is talking about. We preach reality. 
We understand that this world is a present evil world. We understand that we are not going to change the world. All we are going to do is change individual people one at a time. Change their souls. Get them to realize that they need a Savior so they don't spend eternity in hell. The third reason to mention God's terror, it motivates believers to persuade others. Let me read you Hebrews 9.27. And you'll see in this passage the two most hated words. And, it is appoint, and as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this, the judgment. After this are the two mo most hated words. If you're not a believer. If you're not a believer, you think you're just going to go die and just turn to compost, right? Well, your body does turn to com compost, but souls go to one of two places, heaven or hell. Hebrews 2.13, And deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. Death is said to be the king of fears. Not the king of beers now. Not the blood man. The king of fears, isn't it? What does God, what does Paul say about death? death? It's absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. The one verse that's been stuck in my mind for two years now, Ecclesiastes 7 1. The day of one's death is better than the day of one's birth, if you're saved. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of the saints. Can you imagine going to a Catholic church and saying, God called me a saint? <laughs> they don't have to fabricate two or three miracles that you did in your life. No, God calls me a saint. Yeah. Revelation 9, verses 5 and 6. Listen to this passage. This is when the, the pit is opened up and these creatures start coming out of the pit. This is fits in the ages of the come time period. We're not part of that. And to them it was given that they should not kill them, but that they should be tormented five months. And their torment was as the torment of a scorpion when he striketh a man. And in those days shall men seek death and shall not find it, and shall desire to die, and death shall flee from them. Are you wanting, willing to gamble on something like this? Can you imagine putting a bullet in your head, then waking up a few seconds later with all the pain still? What are you talking about? There's no artist in the world who could accurately depict or draw this or illustrate what these creatures look like. What was that movie back in the 70s? The uh, um, she, Green Vomit? No. Exorcist. I saw that when it came out. It scared the hell out of me. Man, excuse the word, but it, it, it did. It really scared me. And eventually, if I would have died, then I'd be in hell right now. I know that. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, Verses 3 and 4 talks about being a soldier. Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No man that worth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life. That he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. This is the only time this phrase is used in the Bible. And affairs is the only time this word is used in the Bible. This talk is talking about business and occupation, pursuits to civil life. When I got out of the Marine Corps, I was a soldier, then I became a civilian. This is pursuing civil things. It's opposite of warfare. When you're inducted in, or when you join a, uh, the Army or whatever branch of service you're in, you're a soldier, and they train you. Now, when you realize that you're saved and you can't lose your salvation, when you believe the gospel, the grace of God, you've been inducted. You, you are not inducted. You've joined willingly. Now you're a soldier. How are you going to train? Read his word, right? Study his word, rightly divided. Put yourselves in position, always, you know, of, of where you have to use your sword. In 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 1 and 2, it says, For as much then as Christ hath suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves likewise with the same mind. For the, he that hath suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. 
1 Corinthians 2.16 says, For who hath known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. The last verse in 2 Timothy 2, I remember about two decades ago, Rick gave me the last three verses in 2 Timothy 2. Something I needed. Here's the last verse in that. And that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who are taken captive by him at his will. To be taken captive means you are a prisoner of war. But when I was in the military, it taught us something. It teaches you to fight, also teaches you to guard, and they go over, if you're ever captured, your duty is to try to escape from that enemy. That's why the, the phrase good fight is only used by Paul. I fight a good fight, I finished my course, I've kept the faith. The terror of the Lord is absolutely awful. Let me read you some verses. We're almost done. Matthew 10, 28, which says, And fear them which fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Second Peter 2, 20 and 21. For if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world, through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled therein and overcome. The latter end is worse with them than the beginning. For it had been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than after they have known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered unto them. Is this our doctrine? Can we turn? Can we give our salvation away? Can we turn from the doctrine? Sure we can. But do we lose our salvation as this passage depicts? You see the difference between these programs? In James chapter 1, 13 to 15, it says, Well, you can't, you can't blame it on the God. You, the, the, the sin comes out of you. One more thing. Let me show you the dispensational difference between 2 Timothy 2, 4. Let me read it to you. No man that worth entangle himself with the affairs of this life. And Second Peter 2.20, which I just read, for if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled therein. They're overcome. Paul says in Galatians 4.9, But now after ye have known God, or rather known of God, how turn ye again to the weak and beggarly elements, whereunto ye desire again to be in bondage? Bondage. If you know somebody, can you unknown them? Well, you can forget them. Can God unknow you? No. We talk about the born again issue, which is for Israel in the future. They're going to be born as a nation in, in a day. But there is a new birth of sorts spoken by Paul to the Galatians. Galatians 4.19 my little children of whom I travail on birth again until Christ be formed in you. Did you get that? You didn't lose your salvation. He's trying to get, get you to put away your carnal mind, to walk in the Spirit and not in the flesh. The word formed, again, it's only used by Paul, only one time, which means until the mind and life in complete harmony with God and complete harmony with the mind and life of Christ shall have been formed in you. This is an inward, internal, spiritual condition. We already know we can't lose our salvation or give it away because it is promised gift from God. So, 2 Timothy 2.13 says, If we believe not, yet he abideth faithful, he cannot deny himself. Now you compare that with Hebrews 10, 26 and 27. For if we sin willfully... After that we have received the knowledge of truth. There remaineth no more sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation which shall devour the adversaries. This is different than our doctrine. And if you don't understand and believe Pauline truth, you are receiving the word of God in vain. A soldier not only fights for the truth, a soldier also guards and protects the truth for others. Dear Lord, thank you for this time in your word.
I just pray that as soldiers, we continue to train, we continue to learn, we continue to, to fight the good fight. I just pray this in your son's name. Amen.